Right now, we're looking at our lab's UV transilluminator, which we use to excise bands from our agarose gels. When we turn this on, as you can see, our DNA fluoresces orange because we've added gel red to our gels. Just to note, to turn this machine on, the switch is over here on the front. You want to make sure that it's set to 302 nanometers. The intensity of the fluorescence will be considerably less at 365 nanometers. I'm going to go turn off the lights really quickly so that we can see these bands a little bit better. And when we turn the transilluminator back on, we can see those bands again. Now, I've prepared two 2 mil centrifuge tubes here uh, for my samples, and I've already labeled them. So to cut these out, I'm going to use a razor blade. I'm going to want to make sure that that's nice and clean first, so I'm going to clean that off with some 70% ethanol and a Kim wipe. And I'm going to start. So as you can see, I've run, I've run many of my bands off the gel, and that's because what I'm doing right here is a vector digest. I'm interested in this higher molecular weight band, so it was a pet vector that I digested, and I cut the vector at three spots. I'm interested in cloning in between NDE1 and HINDI3, but I've also cut here at BSRG1 uh, to prevent my backbone from closing again. So cutting with that BSRG1 will help reduce background when I'm cloning. But as you can see, I'm going to expect a 7,000 base pair band between the NDE1 and the BSRG1. I'm expecting about a 1,300, or sorry, a 700 base pair band between the NDE1 and the BSRG1. And I'm expecting about a 1,300 base pair band between the BSRG1 and the HINDI3. I've already run the 700 base pair band off the gel, um, and I want to excise the 5,380 base pair band, or roughly 5,000 base pair band. Um, so that's that top band there. So I've got my clean, uh, I've got my clean razor blade here. It helps if you grab a newer, sharper one when you do this. Okay, so I'm just kind of moving this UV face shield up here. You want to be gentle with it because as you can see it's already cracked uh, down here. That's why we've got tape on it. But I'm keeping this shield between me and the UV so that I don't get blasted in the face with 35,000 watts of UV light. When I cut these, uh, you want to cut as close to the band as possible because the agarose will actually um, will compete for adsorption sites on your either your silica or whatever membrane you may be using on a spin column. So it's a good idea to try to cut as small of a band as possible. So again, I'm cutting right next to the fluorescent band. Okay, so I'll just kind of tear my gel apart like that. And come on. Let's, so as you can see, it looks like my DNA goes basically all the way up to the top of the gel. It fluoresces orange all the way up. If, for example, you poured a thicker gel, you would want to cut off any part that wasn't fluorescing. So now I'm just going to kind of push that up onto the... You'll want to make sure that your gloves are clean also before you do this. I'll push that up onto the razor blade, and then I'll just kind of scoot that gel fragment down into the 2 mil tube. Okay. So again, now I'm going to go for the second one. We'll clean that off briefly with 70% ethanol again. You can tell if this razor blade's getting a little bit old because uh, it's kind of cutting raggedy on the agros. So I'm going to take off this little remaining bit here because I don't want to contaminate. Um, I don't want to contaminate this band with any of what was over there. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to make sure that I'm cutting as close to the band as possible. Of course, this one's a little bit curved, so it makes that slightly more difficult, but that's all right. I'll try to get rid of that, whatever that frizzy thing is there. And I'm just going to cut at a slight angle. Excellent. 
so there's my DNA sample. Again, it's fluorescent through the width of the gel slab, so I don't have to cut any of that off. And I'm just going to scoot that one into my next centrifuge tube. Oh, come on. There we go. Now, I'm going to clean that off, obviously, but these two gel slices are ready to go into a gel extraction. For the next step in our gel extraction, we need to take the mass of the auger slabs that we just cut out of our gel so that we know exactly how much QG buffer and how much isopropanol we'll need to add later on. So first, we're going to tear with a, an empty uh, microcentrifuge tube. I usually don't have the presence of mind to weigh all of these beforehand, and plus, they're about plus or minus 0.02 grams, and we don't really need to be much more precise than that, which is why we're not using an analytical balance. So I'm going to place that on there. Press zero. And I'll weigh my first auger slice. 0 0.11 grams. So I'll just label that. And now the next one. And this one's 0 0.13 grams. Now we need to melt our agar slab so that we can get the DNA out. So we're going to do that by adding QG buffer to them. Um, for this procedure, we add three volumes of QG buffer to our uh, agar slabs. So what we mean by a volume, one volume, when we say that, that's equal to one mil per gram. So we have 0.11 grams of agar slab in here, so we're going to add 0.33 mils. So I'm going to take my P1000, set to 330 microliters, and I'm going to pipette that into the first one. Note that I'm not working sterile here because we're going to be doing a cleanup on these later anyways. So again, this is QG buffer. The QG buffer contains guanidine thiocyanate, which is going to lower the melting temperature of the agarose. So when we put it in a 50 degree water bath, it will melt. And this next sample contains 0.13 grams of agarose slab. So that's going to be um, 0.39 mils, or 390 microliters. Okay. At this point, I'm going to take both of these samples and I'm going to put them in a 50 degree water bath. I'll vortex them intermittently until the agarose is completely dissolved. I just had my agar slabs uh, dissolving in QG buffer for the past 10 minutes in the 50 degree oven. And actually, while you guys weren't watching, I tossed two more in. You want to make sure that your agar is, ar sorry, your agarose is completely dissolved by uh, rocking that back and forth and looking to see if there's any swirling or uh, filamentous bits of agarose that are left undissolved. When you're confident that your agarose is completely dissolved, Go ahead, pop these open, and to each tube, add 100 microliters of glass milk. That's going to provide a substrate for adsorption of your DNA.
And now we are going to add one volume of isopropanol. And that's going to help uh, precipitate out the DNA onto the, uh, onto the silica. Okay, so this one's 0.24 grams. I'm just going to do 120 microliters twice so that I don't have to go and get my P1000. Okay, uh, this one is 0 0.10 grams, so set that to 100 microliters. This one's 0 0.11 grams, so 110 microliters of isopropanol. And this one's 0.13 grams, so 130 microliters of isopropanol. Okay, now at this point we can put these on the new tater plate. I've already got two preps going there. But um, you have the option of adding uh, sodium, three molar sodium acetate to these uh, to help precipitate out your DNA. And you typically want to do that based on um, experience and what the pH of this buffer is. Uh, today I'm going to add it, but I would check with somebody who has more experience um, when you're deciding whether or not to add it for a particular prep. Uh, furthermore, we don't have to be too precise about this. Uh, the Kaijin guidelines just say add 20 microliters to an average sized prep. So these three are fairly small. That one's average size. So I'm going to add 10 microliters to each of these three and 20 to that one because that one's about twice the size. Okay. Again, I'm not working sterile here because I'm about to put these into a cleanup and I'll be washing with ethanol so sterility is not or working with good aseptic technique is not particularly important at this point. And now I'm going to add 20 microliters to the last one. before I put all four of these on the new tater plate. I'm going to give them about 10 minutes to allow all the DNA plenty of time to absorb onto the silica. That's particularly important uh, that that incubation time or that, that allowing that time for the DNA to absorb is particularly important when you're um, doing an extraction from an agarose slab because the agarose will uh, compete with adsorption sites for the DNA so it's good to leave it plenty of time to adsorb. After leaving these on the nutator plate, I'm going to spin them down now in order to collect the silica powder from the bottom. I guess I had two other samples in there. So I'm going to spin these down just as I would for a DNA cleanup, which is basically what we're doing now at 4000 RCF for about 15 seconds. Do it. 
now we're going to decant the QG buffer off into our liquid waste. The QG buffer, the supernatant, should contain most of the agarose. And because we want to really make sure that we're getting rid of all the QG buffer, or as much as possible, and the agarose, we're going to give these a quick spin down. Just a couple seconds, just enough to get all the QG to the bottom. And I'm going to aspirate the last of the QG out using a P200. I'll just eject those tips straight into the solid waste. Okay, now I'm going to resuspend all of these in PE buffer, just as we would in a DNA cleanup, which again is pretty much, well, which is pretty much what we're doing now. Take my P1000, wash with 75 microliters of PE. So I'm going to resuspend those uh, on my vortex mixer over here. And after this point, it really is just a DNA cleanup. So if you follow that procedure all the way through to eluding your DNA, then you'll end up with a clean digest product at the end, or PCR product, or whatever you are running on your gel. With that, thank you for listening, and we'll see you for the next video.